Hi, I'm Sagar Karendakar, and this is FirePerf, FPGA Accelerated Full System Hardware Software Performance Profiling and Co-Design. So let's begin by taking a look at how architects build systems. We usually start with high-level simulation, where we spec out our idea. Then we get to the implementation phase, where we write RTL and software, and we plug this into some ecosystem that provides SOC components. Then we get to the co-design phase, where we start with software RTL simulation, where we run micro benchmarks on our design to understand how the design behaves. When we want to run more substantial applications on top, we switch to a faster simulation platform, like an FPGA accelerated simulation platform. Lastly, once we're satisfied with our design, we go through the tape out process to end up with a chip uh, where we can run all of the applications we want. But of course, at this phase, we can no longer change the hardware design. So in this talk, we're going to focus on the FPGA accelerated simulation flow, in particular, how we can enhance that flow to achieve better performance profiling and optimization of our system. So let's take a quick aside and look at why we want to use FPGA simulators rather than FPGA prototypes. So consider building uh, an SOC. We have RTL for this SOC, and we tape it out. And let's say it runs at a gigahertz. And we want to attach to DRAM. And let's say that DRAM has 100 nanoseconds of access latency. So software running on this system will see 100 cycles of DRAM latency. On the other hand, if we build an FPGA prototype out of this uh, RTL, that design will run at around 100 megahertz, let's say, on the FPGA. But it'll still be attached to DRAM, which has 100 nanoseconds of latency. So if we run software on this FPGA prototype, the SOC or the software will see uh, incorrect DRAM latency. It'll just see 10 cycles of DRAM latency. So let's take a quick look at a, a sort of design that we might be interested in. So this is a design that we'll use throughout this talk as an example, and it'll be a system that we optimize in our case study. So this is a quad-core RISC-V rocket chip based system. Uh, the interesting thing here uh, is that this system has an Ethernet NIC attached to it. This NIC is implemented in Chisel, and it's intended to be able to drive a 200 gig Ethernet network. So we can take a design like this in FireSim uh, and build an FPGA simulation out of this design. So essentially what this means is that we take the design, we clock gate it, and we add models around it that provide correct I.O. performance uh, from the perspective of the simulated system. In particular, one of these models that we'll be interested in here is the NIC simulation endpoint, which will correctly model uh, Ethernet, uh, an Ethernet network between the multiple nodes that we'll simulate. Then in FireSim, we can scale out. So we can run multiple simulations networked together by an Ethernet network model, uh, eventually scaling to something like a 32 node rack scale simulation across eight FPGAs. So here we have 32 copies of that SOC design I showed you. Uh, network together using this top of rack switch model that correctly models uh, a 32 node uh, rack of systems. So then we might ask the question, well, okay, we have the simulation of a 32 node system. So how well does this target system actually perform if we run networking applications on top? So in the original FireSim work, there was a bare metal NIC ben micro benchmark uh, that was run on the system. So if you run this micro benchmark, uh, on the system, you can see that it can easily drive in excess of 100 gigabits per second. So 100 gigabits per second in this, in this throttled example, or up to 150 gigabits per second without throttling. On the other hand, if you try to run real network software, uh, this runs poorly. So if we run a benchmark like iPerf3 on top of Linux, on top of two simulated nodes, uh, then we see poor performance. In fact, we only see 1.4 gigabits per second. Again, this is a system that should be able to drive 200 gigabits per second. So if we want to understand what's happening in a system like this, we want to see where the bottlenecks are. Well, we see that there's a vast space of possibilities. First off, there's the application itself. Then there's Linux components like the TCP IP stack, as well as other OS code. There's the driver that we wrote for uh, our NIC design, and then the NIC RTL itself. And of course, because this is a networked scenario, there's an entire other node that we have to worry about, as well as a switch sitting in between them. So if we want to profile a system like this, what could we do? Well, we could try a variety of different optimizations that we might know about, that we might read about. Or we could hire someone who just happens to know the answer. But more realistically, we're going to try to use a profiling tool to figure out where we should focus our efforts. So one type of tool is an in-band target software profiling tool. These are tools like Perf or Ftrace or Strace that we run on the system itself to collect information about the system. 
The downside here is that we're changing the software running on the system, and if we do something like sample too often, we'll perturb the results that we're trying to collect. To avoid this, we could try out-of-band profiling of software using something like a trace port. The downside to this sort of approach is that we can only capture short snippets. We could also try in-band hardware profiling, where we're trying to understand more details about what the hardware is doing by doing things like collecting performance counter information. But the issue here is that we can't sample these counters too often, otherwise we'll perturb the results. And very often, we have a limited set of performance counters that we can use. So FirePerf introduces two new FireSim features that uh, improve on profiling capabilities in FPGA accelerated simulators and take advantage of features of FPGA accelerated simulators to provide better profiling. So these two tools are Tracer 5 for software profiling and AutoCounter for hardware profiling. So what is Tracer 5? It's a FireSim bridge that allows us to collect a commit trace from our simulated systems, cycle exactly, and out of band. And so this can include information like the instruction address, instruction bits, and other components, basically producing the trace you see on the right-hand side. The nice thing here is that if the FPGA to host transport is backed up and it can't uh, copy off the trace quickly enough, this will back pressure the simulation and stop simulated time from advancing so we can make sure that we can collect a full trace without perturbing the simulated system. Another nice feature is the ability to trigger this logging on and off, uh, and we can do this both from inside and outside the simulation. Of course, having just an instruction trace isn't that useful for profiling. What we'll actually do is have a driver that sits on the host system that will unwind the execution stack best effort on the fly, correlating it with the OS binary or other software running on the system, uh, and feed this into a tool like the flame graph tool uh, to produce visualizations of where we're spending time uh, in our system running software. Now, if we want to profile the hardware in our system, we'd also like an out-of-band way to do that. So in effect, we're going to add auto counter, which enables us to inject counters into our system and sample those performance counters as often as we want. So for example, we could take our NIC design that we're trying to optimize later uh, in this case study and add counters to it to better understand what's happening inside. The way we do this is by taking advantage of an existing API in open source hardware like Rocketship uh, called the Cover API, which essentially allows uh, designers to show that they uh, are marking a signal as interesting. So usually this is used for verification purposes, but in FireSim with AutoCounter, we essentially uh, interpret signals marked with covers as events that want to be counted. Then of course, what we can do is automatically pull these off of the FPGA and log them to disk out of band. And this also supports the same triggering functionality that Tracer 5 does. So with this, we can sample performance counters as often as we want only trading off simulation performance uh, and fidelity. So here's an example of adding these covers to our NIC RTL. We essentially can just call this cover function, pass it some signal, and give it a name and description uh, to produce this auto counter. Of course, we would like to preserve these in our RTL uh, as we implement that RTL design. Uh, and we don't want to always pull off all of the counter information. So we provide this API to annotate different modules and indicate that you would like to pull off counter information from particular modules. OK, so let's use these tools to actually improve the performance uh, of the system I showed you earlier running networking benchmarks. So again, we're trying to run iperf 3 between two simulated nodes uh, and trying to maximize network performance. Before we do that, we're going to start a little bit simpler in loopback mode. So essentially, what we're going to do here is in order to decouple hardware and software issues, we're going to run in loopback, which basically means that we run the server and client side on the same uh, simulated machine. And so they communicate through the standard Linux networking system, uh, but without involving our NIC driver or our NIC RTL. So in effect, we're just trying to understand the packet handling performance of Rocketship with the RISC V Linux port. So as a quick aside, we might ask the question, well, what about those software profiling tools? We can try something simple like strace uh, to try to understand the sequence of system calls our application is making. So we can ask the question, well, what's the overhead of tracing? And so if we look at our baseline loopback number, so if we run iperf3 like I showed you on the previous slide, we get a result of 4.8 gigabits per second. 
Oddly, when we run this exact benchmark inside strace, our performance improves. This is a pretty confusing result, uh, and I'll explain uh, in a couple of slides exactly what's going on here. But instead of relying on a tool like this, why don't we collect flame graphs uh, using Tracer5 and Firesyn? So here's a flame graph uh, that we collected using the trace coming out of uh, Tracer5 from our simulated system, unwinding it and feeding it to the flame graph tool. So in effect, when we look at one of these flame graphs, what we're looking for are wide bars uh, that are leaves on, uh, on the flame graph. So the x-axis here is a proportion of total benchmark cycles. The y-axis is stack depth. These are call stacks. And so when we see something uh, like ASM copy to user here, which is dominating our runtime, this is something we should look into. So what is this copy user function? Well, it's a memory copy between user space and kernel space and vice versa in the Linux kernel. It's an assembly sequence written per architecture in Linux. And in particular, the RISC-V implementation of this function has a performance pathology. And that is when the source and destination buffers aren't aligned, the implementation resorts to doing a byte-by-byte -byte copy, which makes poor utilization of memory bandwidth. And this is non-deterministic. So this issue is only triggered when you get non-aligned buffers. So the strace example just happens to get aligned buffers more often, which we confirmed by instrumenting the kernel. Of course, this can be optimized, and we implemented uh, an optimization uh, so that we no longer have this performance pathology with unaligned buffers. And once you implement this optimization, our loopback performance goes up to 6.3 gigabits per second. More interestingly, we can immediately deploy this optimization on real shipping RISC-V silicon, like the HiFive Unleashed board, which has a 1 gigabit NIC. So we can take this board, attach it over an Ethernet cable to another system with a 1 gigabit NIC, uh, and run iperf3 on both sides. And you can see right off the bat that comparing the baseline to our optimized copy user, uh, we can see large speedups. In fact, uh, in this particular example, the, the top row in this table, we can see that the High 5 Unleashed can actually get close to saturating its one gigabit NIC. Now, the software optimized uh, version of copy user here uh, is essentially as optimized as possible. We show this with some auto counter based performance analysis uh, in the paper, but I don't have time to uh, cover that in this talk. So given that our software is as optimized as possible and we want to continue to get performance improvement, we're going to hardware accelerate copy user. The way we're going to do that is by adding the Huacha vector accelerator to our design. This is an open source vector coprocessor with virtual memory and Linux support. So we can modify the Linux kernel, the copy user implementation, to call out to Huacha to do these memory copies. Once we do this, our uh, loopback performance improves to 16 gigabits per second, so a substantial improvement from doing this. If we look now at the networked case, where we actually have two simulated nodes, uh, we also see a performance improvement here. So we're comparing the baseline of 2 gigabits per second to our now Huacha accelerated uh, performance of 3.2 gigabits per second. So now let's take a look at the networked flame graph. So if we look at the networked flame graph here, you'll see copy user has disappeared. Um, but we see this other function called do checksum. This is, in fact, doing checksumming in software. Uh, and so we'll implement a well-known optimization, which is to implement checksum offloading in our NIC. Once we do this, uh, our performance in the networked case improves to 4.24 gigabits per second. Now, if we had looked at another flame graph after implementing that checksum offloading improvement, we would find that there's really no obvious software culprits to, to continue to optimize. So instead, let's take a look at the hardware by injecting performance counters with auto counter. In particular, we're going to look at the send request queue occupancy in the NIC. So this histogram is essentially showing you how occupied the queue is, uh, where we essentially write descriptors of packets that we want to send out. So here, if we zoom in, uh, we'll essentially see that our baseline case and the optimized case we have so far, which is labeled optimized no interrupt mitigation, is doing pretty poorly. This queue never contains more than one entry at a time, which means that we're not getting good batching effects while trying to send out packets. Ideally, what we'd like to happen is software comes along, writes a bunch of packets for the NIC to send, and goes and does other work. So we can look at where Linux actually writes into this queue. Well, this function is called icenet start xmit. This is what directly does that MMIO read and write into those queues. And we like it to be sending packets in bursts. 
But if we actually look at the stack trace coming out of Tracer 5, and in even more detail, the actual instruction trace coming out of Tracer 5, we can see that the completion interrupt that indicates that a buffer is able to be reused after a send has completed is actually happening immediately when icenet start xmit re-enables interrupts after writing one descriptor out. And this is actually difficult to observe with perf because perf sampling itself relies on timer interrupts. We could use a more complicated mechanism uh, that isn't generic like NMIs to solve this problem, but this isn't currently implemented for RISC-V. So to resolve our performance pathology here, we can modify the NIC driver to support Linux's NAPI uh, driver design. And this allows us to implement interrupt mitigation. So essentially, we adaptively disable device IRQs and switch to polling under high load. And this lets us amortize interrupt cost over many interrupts. So once we do this, we can now zoom out in this histogram and see much better queue occupancy. So this is the optimized with interrupt mitigation uh, set of bars on this histogram. So in fact, we now actually see that queue occupancies can rise as high uh, as the 30s. And this indicates that this queue is actually filling up. So software is coming along, writing a large batch of packets, uh, and then going to do other work. And if we look at our actual performance, it improves uh, up to 6.7 gigabits per second once we've implemented this, this improvement. So what's left? If we looked at the flame graph now, we wouldn't see any additional bottleneck functions. The hardware queue utilization has improved, uh, and, and we're doing a pretty good job utilizing NIC resources. Um, but there's still some underutilization due to software processing overhead. So we want to amortize this overhead using larger packets. So we're going to use an optimization called Jumbo Frames, which is a well-known optimization uh, in, in Ethernet, where we can essentially increase the payload in each Ethernet frame. So we amortize the cost of generating headers uh, for our payloads. Uh, and this is an optimization that, for example, cloud providers use in their network-optimized instances. So once we do this, in the dual core networked case, we can now hit 17.5 gigabits per second. So this table essentially summarizes the optimizations that we've made throughout this talk. Uh, so in particular, you can see that in the dual core case, we've improved our real networked performance from 2.12 gigabits per second, where we started, all the way up to 17.5 gigabits per second by using our, our FireProof tools to sort of method methodologically see where to make improvements. As a comparison point, uh, if we run a single iperf 3 connection between 200 gig networking instances on EC2, we see comparable performance. Of course, if we run multiple copies of iperf 3 uh, on these EC2 instances, they are capable of saturating uh, their 100 gig network. We're still working on multi-core scalability within this, uh, this system, uh, and so that's left to future work. So to wrap up, FireProof introduced two novel out-of-band profiling features for FPGA simulation. Those are Tracer 5 for software profiling out-of-band and AutoCounter for hardware profiling out-of-band. These are both already available in open source FireSim. Uh, and these underwent the artifact evaluation process for ASPLOS 2020 and received the maximum available artifact evaluation badges. So as I showed you in our case study, we used FireSim with FireProof to discover improvements uh, that resulted in an 8x improvement in network bandwidth uh, on our modeled system. And in fact, one of these software optimizations directly translates to actual shipping silicon today. And we're working on upstreaming this to uh, the upstream uh, Linux repo uh, now. So with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, thanks for your time watching this talk, and I'll be happy to address any questions either by email uh, or on the ASPLOS 2020 Slack. Thanks.